In our last episode, we retrieved all of the power armor that was stolen from the Brotherhood by the Quincy Raiders. We explored the whole town of Coldwater, which was interesting, found our first casino there. But now that we've completed our mission, we can head back to Bunker Delta to find out what's next. I again worked on the squad's energy weapon skills. Got Oxhorn up to 150, got Alice up to 150, got Dylan up to 104, Harold up to 150, and then worked on Cookie's big gun skill. Got her up to 136 now. Then checking out the Quartermaster, we see that he has another suit of power armor for sale. Going for the same exorbitant price, but doggone it, if there was anything worth it, it's power armor. Snagging it, we can head back to the motor pool. But it was then I remembered a comment that I got on my most recent video. A number of viewers said that ghouls can wear power armor. Which came as a shock to me. I thought the best armor they could wear was the environmental armor. So trying it out on Harold. Yeah, and he glows right through it. But uh, you all are right. Ghouls can indeed wear power armor. That's amazing news. It means that I can get Dylan and Harold into power armor. I don't want to put Babs in it because of her stealth and all that. I tried putting it on Cookie and sadly it didn't work. But giving it to Oxhorn, we see that it looks different on him than it does on Alice. The character color that we chose when making our character becomes the color of the um, tactical mantle. So since I chose brown, my guy looks like he's wearing a brown mantle with his power armor, whereas Alice in hers is rocking a black mantle. Now that glowing herald issue has been really bugging me. I've scoured the internet, can't seem to find a single person who's had the same problem I did. Someone in the comments said a few videos ago that they thought that maybe Harold was glowing, that this is what he looks like when he's suffering from too much radiation. But, I mean, I checked out his status and being irradiated wasn't on there, but I tried giving him a bunch of rad away anyway. He kept on saying that he looks better, but nothing ever changed. I gave him so much rat away <laughs> that he overdosed, became unconscious and immobile. He wasn't irradiated, but he still had that strange glowing effect. And I'm not using any mods in this game, so I still don't have an answer for it. At any rate, when the squad is ready, we can learn from General Decker what comes next. At ease, warrior. I have mixed news to give. A Reaver delegate arrived earlier today, bringing news that a large robot force has all but annihilated the main Reaver camp in Newton. The Reaver's numbers have been devastated by relentless attacks and will soon be destroyed unless we intervene. Normally, the Brotherhood would gladly allow one enemy to destroy another, but the Reavers have something to offer. The Reaver movement has developed a new type of weapon based on robot pieces that they've been able to scavenge. This weapon is called an EMP device and it has a devastating effect on electronics. It is this weapon that is allowing the Reavers to survive a mass robot attack, but for them, it is still too little, too late. They have agreed to give the Brotherhood both a prototype of this weapon and instruction on its workings in exchange for rescue of their four highest ranking officials in Newton's Junk City. This might be the edge we're looking for against the robots. Bring back that prototype, brother. You will be supplied with a map to Newton. Rendezvous at the extraction zone with all four elders, and they will be transported via APC and armored escort back here. Dismissed. Oh, what? We're working with the Reavers now? Man, things must be getting pretty bad out there. First the mutants, and now the Reavers. Well... Since there's no one new in the recruits pool, we can head to the Hummer and make our way to the world map. We find Newton, northwest of Bunker Delta. And along the way, I stumbled upon another special encounter. I bring it up because during this random encounter, we find the water gun. Remember that weapon I talked about a couple of missions ago that's supposed to be really, really good against robots? Well, this is that weapon a modified water gun. 
The brightly colored casing of this seemingly harmless weapon belies the fact that it has been shielded with a ceramic coating, making it perfect for carrying acid loads. It has a minimum strength of five, and its ammo is the HCL vials of acid that we picked up in Great Bend. So we've got plenty of ammo for this thing. It does between 5 and 25 damage with a range of 24 and an ammo capacity of 10, which isn't incredibly stellar, but maybe it's got some sort of bonus against metal armor and robots. We'll have to test it out in the field. I'll cover the special encounter where we find it when I do my video on all of the special encounters in Fallout Tactics. Upon arriving at Newton, we can take a look at Brotherhood Reconnaissance. This green circle to the northeast is our insertion point. Directly west of us, we learn that this is our extraction point. Rendezvous here with the four elders to complete our mission. Far to the south of us, we find a gray circle. The barracks for the Reaver base is located here. And then each of these red circles are numbered. In Circle 1, we learn the Chief Medical Division is barricaded in this building. Then in Circle 2, the Ambassador is barricaded in this storage building. In Circle 3, we learn the Research Laboratory is located there. And in Circle 4, the General and his bodyguard are inside the old Nuka-Cola plant there. All right, I gave the water gun to Oxhorn. I wanted to test it out during this mission. Moving east down the road, we bump up against the world map, so we've got to go west. Turning south, we find a building, and we see a hole in the western wall. Lying outside the hole is a body, so taking the squad in. Taking a look at the combat log, we see that Oxhorn never got a chance to attack. As soon as the battle started, he was the first one hit, and he was knocked unconscious. So he was out for the whole battle. Well, we'll have to try things with just Oxhorn to test out the gun later. After looting the wreckages, we can examine the corpse and the hole in the wall. Here we find a stim pack, a cherry nuka cola, and some beef jerky. There's a hole in the wall to the east, a door on the wall to the south, and a staircase leading up. Moving upstairs with Babs, we find another room. Her perception picks up a robot lying prone on the other side of this wall, behind some sandbag barricades. There is a workbench here. We find a paramedic's bag, some dynamite, and ammunition. Well, this is the perfect opportunity to test out the water gun, bring an ox horn upstairs. We can send him out the door, hide him behind the sandbag barricades, and then cautiously move him closer. Oh, and uh, apparently the water gun is silent. Of course it would be. It shoots liquid. I mean, even with my best hit, I only got him for 23 damage. So switching to the plasma rifle. Oh, and that's 33. Ooh, and my crits went all the way up to 55. Well, I mean, it's a no-brainer for me. The squirt gun did less damage, cost one more AP, and it has less range than the plasma rifle. Interesting and unique weapon, but ultimately, we've already outgrown it. We see a sky bridge that crosses a street leading into a building to the west. Moving south, we see a patio. We don't know if anyone's on the patio. Our perception doesn't pick up anything just yet. Well, only one way to find out. Creeping forward. Ah! What is that? Oh, jeez. It's more terrifying than the spider mines from Operation Acreage. These are scurry bots. Ugh. This guy was hiding behind this pylon. There's nothing on his inventory. Just then, the crew on the bottom level got attacked. But it was a quick fight. Back to Oxhorn above, we can heal him up and see if there are any others around here. Run away! Keep running! Oh, then he goes and hides somewhere. What? Oh, he went back outside. 
Come here, you. I'm gonna gotcha. And the plasma is effective. Well, great, so we've got those to look forward to. We find a ladder leading to a top level of this building, but moving up here, we don't find anything. Just a bunch of pillars, but nothing behind them. Heading back down, we find a ladder on the western side. And as we climb down it... Whoa, what is that? Oh, it flies! It's like a, a flying manta ray, but... Uh, kind of like an iBot. Is that an iBot? I don't think it's an iBot. But it kind of hovers like an iBot, and it shot some sort of explosive at us. Oh, there he goes. Oh, creepy. Okay, so we've got that to look forward to as well. Two new types of robotic enemies so far in this map. Well, now that Oxhorn is on the ground, we can bring Dylan out to see if he can target any nearby robots from this rooftop. But no, not even Dylan could spot anything from the rooftop. That is, until he crept close to the sky bridge. Ooh, and down it went with one laser rifle shot. Are they really that weak? I look forward to finding out. Well, of all of the marked locations on our map, I first wanted to explore the Reaver's Barracks. Maybe we'll find some people to talk to there. Then we can take care of all of the other locations in numerical order. So bringing Dylan down, I was about to have him rejoin the squad when... Whoa, what's that? Is that a wreck? I've never seen that. It's a tank! What? And we can get in it, uh, but we can't drive it for some reason. Oh man, I found a tank and I can't use it. Why can't I use this tank? Oh, it must be broken. Harold, I need you, Harold. Grabbing Harold, we can take him and Cookie out the eastern door just to see what was down there, but there's nothing down there. Then grabbing Harold, we can use his repair kit to repair the tank. And look at that, a bunch of brand new, nice, shiny treads hopping in. Oh, we can drive this thing, you betcha. It's slow. And, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really slow. But it's a tank. I think I'm gonna have fun with this. Well, um, I said a minute ago that I wanted to check out the Reaver's Barracks, didn't I? But uh, there's this big wall in the way. Can't bring a tank there, and I doubt I could fit down this alleyway. So, well, we'll leave the tank in the middle of the road for now and come back to it when we start to head towards our numerical objectives. Grabbing the squad, we find a break in the wall to the south, and we can make for it. Peeking in. Oh. Oh, those things. Oh, I hate those things. No, we can't kill them with one laser rifle hit. I don't know how I killed the other one with Dylan with just one shot. Maybe it was already damaged or damaged himself with his own missile fire. But uh, this is going to take our Girl Scout. The other one's hiding behind this wall. Would you like a thin mint? His volley got interrupted by a rocket. Inspecting the wreckages, yeah, these little hover bots are basically roving rocket launchers. They use rockets as ammunition. Oh, fun. Well, we survived. So moving on, against the eastern wall, we find an alarm, but we can't really interact with it, turn it off or on. We can't shoot it or destroy it in any way. So I kind of just ignored these. I think they're just here for set decoration. We find a door in the eastern wall, but heading out, we don't find anything. We bump up against the edge of the map. Nothing out here. So moving the squad west, we see a gate bordering this reaver village to the south, and we appear on the other side of that gate that was blocking our tank from moving south earlier. We can loot the hover bot that Dylan amazingly destroyed with one hit earlier. We find a break in the fence leading to building marked number one to the west, but we'll go there in a minute. Instead, we can continue south. We pass by the Nuka-Cola factory to our west with some tracks nearby. 
On top of this Nuka-Cola factory, we find some Reavers standing guard, and as we get close to a building marked Nuka-Cola, Oh, what a nightmare! It's like tremors! These things pop out of the ground! I was really upset. Cookie's minigun did great against the flying ones a minute ago, but he was missing a lot against these scurry bots, and when he hit, he was doing like five damage. I ended up having to switch to the browning with her just to kill the scurry bots. Maybe they've got some kind of crazy armor factor or something, I don't know. But we're not done. Moving close to the building. And I think that does it. These loaders here were already wrecked. Looks like the Reavers on the nearby rooftop took out all the ones that were visible, but they couldn't hit these scurry bots that were buried underground. Well, we've reached the southern edge of the map, and after looting the dead, we can move into this Nuka Cola building, and we just find a bunch of Nuka Cola sitting on the ground here. Well, the general guy wasn't in this shack, so that must mean he's held in the factory just to our west and he's probably guarded by a bunch of enemies. Well, I said I was going to do these in numerical order, so moving east, we can head through a gate to explore this Reaver town. But we find the Reavers dead! And we found their murderers. On the body of one Reaver is three plasma grenades and a stim pack on the other. We find a third Reaver body. He has another stim pack. This Reaver town is really interesting. It appears to be made entirely out of shipping containers. Moving into the first building, we find that the Reavers are actually still alive. This guy is lying here unhurt. Looks like they were hiding from the robots we destroyed outside. They don't greet us or anything when we come inside. They're a quiet lot. There's nothing in the building. Nearby, however, we do find a watchtower. We can climb the ladder, but at the top of the watchtower, we don't find a thing. Heading behind the building, we find lots of boxcars stacked in a bit of a maze, really. Well, to enter this maze, we can start by walking through a door on this bottom boxcar, but this boxcar is empty. We can then take a ladder just outside to explore this top boxcar. Here we find a shelf with some more canisters of acid for our water gun and two super stim packs. That's it for this one. So taking the ladder back down, we can try to explore these boxes to the south, but I couldn't find a way to get inside them until I got close to this red box car to the right. Moving down an alleyway, we walk through a western door, but it's empty. So heading out and continuing down the alleyway, we can round this gray boxcar to enter through a southern door. It leads us through one, two empty boxcars, but in the middle of this second red empty boxcar is a ladder leading to another boxcar stacked on top. From here, we can head out a southern door to explore a garden planted on top of the roof of this gray boxcar. There's another nearby. These reavers appear to grow cacti and succulents and keep them on their roofs. This walkway circles around back behind this brown boxcar, but we don't find anything on the roofs. However, from here we find another ladder inside leading to another rooftop. We find more rooftop gardens, but these are all empty, nothing of interest. So heading back down, we can go out an eastern door to explore this boxcar. There's a door to the north that leads to another rooftop garden. And I was about to leave when peering through this window, we see what appears to be a square hole in the floor of this boxcar. And yet when I hovered my mouse over it, I didn't really see the climb ladder icon. While working on a hunch, I kind of finangled my mouse over it a few times, clicked here and there until suddenly... climb down a ladder into a hidden secret boxcar with no other way of entry, no doors, no windows. At the back of the boxcar is a fridge. And in the fridge, advanced power armor? What? So the Brotherhood couldn't have made this power armor we bought from the Quartermaster. If we find one here, it must be pre-war. I, I guess unless the Reavers stole it, but we haven't heard of any reports of that. This advanced power armor 
looks just like the Midwestern power armor that we bought from the Quartermaster just this episode. This powered armor is composed of lightweight metal alloys, reinforced with ceramic casings at key points. The motion assist servo motors appear to be high quality models as well. It weighs 50 pounds, ouch. And this set is different from the one we currently have. It's an advanced set. The regular set has an armor class of 39. This one has an armor class of 44 granting us better protection in every damage category except electric, and at least there it remains unchanged. And it grants us one additional strength compared to the other set of power armor. It gives us four instead of three. However, on the model, it looks the same. Even though the icon is gray with blue lighting, it doesn't appear any different on the character. Well, winding our way out of this maze, we can return to the squad and give our old suit of power armor to Harold. We've really only got one more suit to go. Need to find one for Dylan. The boxcars to the north and to the east are empty. We can climb a ladder here, but there's nothing up there. Same with all of the boxcars and rooftops to the south. So when done with the Reaver Village, we can head out the door and continue with the mission. Now, we kind of started to clear this Nuka-Cola factory, but it looks like the facility runs deeper, so we're gonna save that for last. Instead, we can retrace our steps back all the way through that building with the red lighting and then climb to the second floor to take that sky bridge into building marked number one. And as soon as we get on the bridge, Dylan spots someone through a window. Racing to the end, we can fling open the door and charge inside. Dug on scurry bots. We find ourselves on the upper floor of what appeared to be a pre-war office complex. We see a door to the north, and then a door leading to this small square room directly in front of us. Having Oxhorn go in there, we just find a bunch of machinery against the walls, nothing to interact with. And then we find a door leading to an office complex to the south. Moving the squad inside. I was really careful, but we don't find any enemies here. There is a safe on the ground, and in the safe, we find some microfusion cells in a doctor's bag. In the middle of the office complex, we find the body of a reaver, but it's empty. We see a door in the western wall leading to a staircase that'll bring us down, and then a door in the northern wall leading to a hallway. Our perception picks up two robots there hunkered down waiting for us. There's no other way into this hallway. We've got to do it. We can race in first with our power armor wearers to get the aggro. Then bring in the rest. However, upon killing the robots, we discover that the door in this hallway... Oh, it's booby-trapped! But even after blowing the booby trap, afterwards we find that it's locked. Trying to pick it with Babs, we see that it can't be picked! Oh, great! So we could have completely avoided this hallway, and nothing changes. Well, looks like the only way to get into this room is to go back through the office, back into the main hallway, retrace our steps north, and then head through this western door. Inside, we find a reaver lying dead on the ground, but a live reaver standing in the northwestern corner, talking to her. I am Glenda Close, first doctor of the movement. I... Uh, I'm honored to meet your acquaintance, beautiful one. I apologize for my words, but you seem an incandescent angel in a time shadowed with darkness. I can feel your energy pulsating within me like an out-of-phase inductor. Lead me to safety while my feet still obey my brain's electro commands. Oh, you must have been sent by his capacitance. I welcome your gift, Holy One. Whoa, calm down there, Glenn Close. With that, uh, the Reaver Elder temporarily joins our squad and must be led to the extraction point. And sure enough, even though we have a full squad, we see that we can target her. She's got a field medic first aid kit and a steer weapon equipped. We can inspect her inventory. She's got five stim packs and she's wearing a special kind of armor, Reaver armor, but there's no description available. We can take all of her stuff off her inventory, transfer it to another squad mate. I then try to steal her armor and we can take it off of her inventory and give it to another squad member, but no one can equip it. Looks like only Reavers can wear it. So there's really no point in taking it unless you're a collector. We can access her character profile Glenda Close is 19 years old. 
She is a raven-haired woman with keen eyes. She is the person in charge of medical research as well as practical applications of medicine in the field. A deeply religious person, Glenda holds the beliefs of her people firmly in her heart. Unfortunately, Glenda is rebounding from a failed relationship. Oh, guess that's why when we met her she was so... chummy? All right, well, we found the first elder. Now to get out of here, you'd think we could go out this door to the west. But no, it's locked. And can we pick it? No, of course we can't pick it, even though we have a lock picker. Trying to pick it does nothing. So, that must mean that surely we could go out this door to the southwest. One of the Reaver elders has died. You have failed your mission. If only you had another chance. Of course we can, but the entire freaking robot army is waiting for us there. Golly. Well, let's try this again. Instead of going out the only door we can go out, we'll retrace our steps back across the sky bridge, back into the next building, down the stairs to the red room, out the break in the wall, and back to our insertion point, where we find... A nifty little tank waiting for us. I wonder if we can use this. Well, before hopping in the tank, I wanted to scout this lower part of the building first. We find a break to the west in the eastern gate. This leads to the structure, where we find a break in its eastern wall. There is the body of a dog by the gate, and the body of a reaver by the wall. The reaver is carrying 50 caliber ammunition and stim packs. We see that the building itself is some sort of pre-war assembly plant, and right on the other side of the building, just where we left them, is the host of robots. We can try to just run and gun first. It's a massage tank! Oh, it's giving Cookie a rubbing! <laughs> oh, run away, Cookie! It's after ya! That was the most ridiculous thing ever! It's some sort of tiny tank with this massage roller thingamabobber at the end of it. <laughs> well, somehow we survived that, dealing with like a fraction of life left. I tried to heal him and I failed. Oh, come on! And then we get attacked by one of those floating iobot things that I missed. Talk about bad luck. Well, we can try this again. Time to use this tank. But hopping in, we see that it only has room for five. We've got two people outside because we've got this Glenda close in our party. But even on a regular map, looks like we would have one person outside the tank. I started by trying to take this tank through the fence and then through the break in the wall, but I found the angles to be absolutely infuriating. So instead we can try to go west down the road. Along the way, we get jumped by a bunch of spider mines. a break in this northern fence, which leads straight to the parking lot. We find the path before us blocked by a stack of logs. Logs that we can't shift, and the tank can't get past. We killed some of these floater bots, but the other guys aren't coming for us, and we can't get any closer. So backing out, we can take some shots to the north. We find a bit of a rubbish maze over here and a couple of robots in there shooting at us. Then, trying to find some other way in, we get charged by a Mr. Handy wannabe. Tried that back entrance again, 
and this time after much finagling, I was eventually able to kind of charge right through. Oh, but then the massage bot comes for us. Get away from me, massage bot. Oh, and it blew up my tank. No, not the tank. Well, we survived, but we lost the tank. I didn't want to lose the tank. This tank ends up being a really impractical vehicle for this map. A tank would be great in like a battlefield with trenches to drive over and mines to explode. You know, a place with some room to work. But here they plop a tank down in the middle of the streets of Newton and we have to navigate this tank through holes and fences, broken walls. It's just not worth it. Maybe I'll find a use for it later, but for now, <laughs> this map's going to be so much easier on foot. So trying a third time, we can leave the tank in the street and go around to the southern side of the building. The problem with these robots is there are a lot of them, and they all have open line of sight to all of my characters. Plus, they've got the massage tank. I needed to find a place where I could fire upon them, but they couldn't all reach me at the same time and this southern alleyway might just be perfect. Assembling most of my crew in a firing line, we can put out Cookie to lure them back here. Got a few of the hoverbots. The massage tank is trying to get at us, but it can't get through the wall. Healing Cookie up. Looks like we got most of the flying ones. We can cautiously step forward. All right, coast is clear. Now to take out the tank. I decided to sneak most of my crew behind these sandbag barricades while the tank was inside the garage preoccupied. But then he spots us and races out to us. But we got most of our snipers behind the sandbags, so we can use our guys in power armor and our mutant to kite the tank around the parking lot. All right, we got it. We didn't lose our tank. We didn't lose a character, and our health is pretty decent. We find even more Reaver bodies lying out here. On one, we find a stim pack. On another, some 9mm ammunition. And then there are three Reaver bodies behind the sandbag barricades. One is empty, one has a stim pack, and the other has three piston spears. Well, we got the Reaver leader, and the factory is clear. I went ahead and put Glenda close in the tank for safekeeping, and it's here I discovered a bit of, uh, well, what I think is a glitch. Because Glenda joins our party, she kind of pushes out one of our characters. The user interface was only designed for six party members, yet if we recruit Glenda with six party members, she gets added as a seventh, and she pushes out one of the tabs of our party members. In this instance, she pushed out Cookie. So I had a hard time targeting Cookie and trading with Cookie and healing Cookie because we really can't access the tab to do so. The only way to access Cookie is to drag the mouse cursor over her or by directly clicking on Cookie's character sprite. And it's this way the entire time until we get rid of Glenda Close. Now, since I had to reload a save, we need to go north through that fence to get rid of the robots in the junk maze. We find one chest against a sandbag barricade inside a happy pie, some muti, three rockets, and afterburner gum. Continuing to the east, we find more of these stinking scurry bots buried in the sand. Ugh. 
this junkyard goes all the way towards our insertion slash extraction point, and here we discover a bunch of Reavers have been hiding out. Looks like they could have fired upon us at any time, but since we're here to help them, they're of course staying low and keeping cool. But there's nothing else over here. Back towards the junk pile, we do see a building here, but we can't get into it since it's at the edge of the map. Continuing west, we leave the junkyard and arrive at a new road. Moving south down the road, we pass some ruins to the west. We'll go there in a second, but I wanted to see if I could make an easier path for our tank. This road does connect to the road where the tank is on, but there's this huge junk pile blocking it. There's no switch over here. It's not a door or a gate. And so I tried to use some dynamite to blow it up. But no, we can't blow it up either. I then tried to use the tank to bash into it. Oh, come on. It's a literal tank. If anything could bash through this, it's a tank. No? Fine. So we can try to have Glenda Close drive our tank through this junkyard to get to us. No. No. Yes. Oh, around the corner. Oh, not too bad. Okay, that was that was actually easier than I expected. All right, so we got the tank. Not sure what good it's gonna do us, but it's here. We can move west to explore these ruins. And of course, we find some robots. Lying on the ground here is a Vindicator minigun, and one of these robots had a tool kit. Hey, all right, at last. We can further repair the tank so it isn't exploded by one massage session from the massage tank. And we see that this tank has an enormous amount of HP. I used the tool kit three times on it, and I still didn't max out its HP. The tank has 395 hit points. That's the most hit points of any drivable vehicle we have found yet even more than the armored personnel carrier, and almost twice that of the Hummer. Bringing Harold back west, we can explore these little shacks, but there's nothing here. It's right up against the border of the map. We can get inside one, but it's empty. So leaving this junkyard through a hole in the fence to the south, we arrive at the other end of that east to west road. Directly south of us is map marker number two. This is where we are going to find the next elder. I sent Babs in stealth to kind of figure out what's going on over here. Pushing up against the northern wall of the building, we don't find any doors, no windows. The same is true with the eastern side of the building, though her perception picks up two automated turrets inside. Oh, great. Moving around to the southern side of the building, we at last find a door and the splattered remains of a reaver creeping forward just to peek our head inside. What is the point of stealth? I've got her stealth up to like 135. I guess I gotta get it up to like 200 or something. Well, this looks like a case for Dylan. Grabbing Dylan and bringing him around the building to the southern east to west road, we can position him on the other side of the sandbag barricades where he finds clear line of sight to one of the turrets inside. And sure enough, we can reach it, but it can't reach Dylan. So we just sit here for a bit. And that laser rifle hits so much harder than the sniper rifle, making this far less tedious. With this one down, we can move slightly to the right to get the next one. And there we go, interior clear. We can loot the body of the dead Reaver just outside. He was carrying one stim pack. We find the western sidewalk blocked off with rubble. There's a hole in the wall, but we can't climb over these boxes to get inside. So we have to go up these steps to enter. Looting each of these turrets, we find over 250 50 caliber rounds. Cookie will like that for her browning. And it looks like the western part of this building is blocked off. To move forward, we have to go up a staircase, which I didn't want to do with Dylan. So grabbing the squad, we can have them move in to meet Dylan. Sending the team up, they immediately find a bunch of traps. So bringing them back down and sending Harold up. Oh God, it's a minefield. Well, we're used to this. We can use Harold in his brand new suit of power armor to disarm and loot all of these mines, mines, mines. 
Everywhere we look is mines and more mines. When the minefield is clear, Harold can open a western door to arrive in another room. We find a staircase leading up, and from here, we can go down a staircase to access the western portion of the first floor of this building, which is otherwise blocked off by a stack of sandbags. The western nook is empty, but we do find a gated-off room to the north. But this is also empty. The southern room is on fire, but it's empty. So, yeah, nothing there, I guess. Bring in Harold back. We find one mine we missed. Mines. And moving him east, we find the Reaver Elder we're here to rescue in a room to the northeast. Opening the door, we can try to talk to him. Blast! Where did I put my multimeter? He says. Come back when you aren't already escorting someone. Oh, really? We can only escort one Reaver at a time? Oh, great. Well, at least we know where he is. We can finish clearing this building before we get rid of Kalenda Close. We find two staircases leading to the third floor, trying to go up the eastern staircase first. Oh, God! Come on, man. Tag on tricks. So there's a turret up there, and it's right by that eastern staircase. Looks like we'll have to go from the west. Reloading a save, we can pop Glenda out of the tank. And since the path behind us is completely clear, we can have her walk unescorted all the way to the extraction point. She gets there and then thanks us. You've brought me to this safe haven. And for that, I thank you. I don't know how to begin explaining this passionate energy between us, except to tell you, I love you. And if you search your soul, you'll find that you possess the same love for me. The differences of our backgrounds and various communicable diseases will be difficult problems to overcome, but with us working together, Satan Soft himself could not bar our way. I'll wait for you inside your quarters, back at your main base. Take care, my love. Oh man, all that talk about communicable diseases is really working? It's funny that these Reavers keep mentioning Satan Soft, which, uh... <laughs> <clears throat> I think uh, was intended to be a slight jab at Microsoft, you know, back in the day when this game was made. Ironic that Microsoft just acquired Bethesda, which owns the rights to Fallout now. And of course, In Exile, founded by former Interplay executives. I wonder what Microsoft would have to say about this. If you hadn't noticed by now, this Glenda Close character is actually a reference to actress Glenn Close, who plays the character Alex Forrest in the 1987 film Fatal Attraction. Alex Forrest was a really, well, let's say clingy lover who was instantly and magnetically drawn to the main character Dan Gallagher, played by Michael Douglas. Nine years. I just want to be a part of your life. Oh, this is the way you do it, huh? Showing up at my apartment? Well, what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls, you change your number. I mean, I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. Hence all of Glenda Close's flirtations we have thus far had to endure. With one of the four elders rescued, we earn 9,950 experience. Then, back at the second building, we can grab Harold, take him through the minefield, and up the second set of stairs. This puts us out on the other side of a wall, blocking access to that other turret. Perfect. Wait a minute. Here we find a switch. What does this do? Does it open the door? No. Opening the door. The turret doesn't fire. It's blinking red. Oh, so if we would have used a stealth character to climb all the way up here, we could have disabled all three turrets without firing at a single one. However, I celebrated too soon. Yeah. Oh, they don't like doors. And he slinks away. These things are creepy as heck. We can herald in. We can try to find the bugger. There you go. He's not over there. Hiding on that side. He's not down there. Well, maybe he's around by the stairs. No. Where did he go? He's not in the turret area. Maybe he went... Yeah! Oh, you sneaky jerk! Whew. Oh, what 
the spider mine thing destroyed, we can loot a chest hiding on the northern side of the sandbag barricade, and inside, three pulse grenades. Then bringing Babs up, we can pickpocket the 50 caliber ammunition from the third turret. Then bringing Harold down, we can open the door to the second elder. This is Albert Lamour. It is necessity that brings me to you, warrior. We Reavers never harbored any love for the Brotherhood, but these mechanical abominations have decimated the Reaver movement. As ambassador for my people, I offer simple terms. You rescue our people, and we share our sacred technology. Refuse, and your Brotherhood will be forced to continue their battle with primitive weapons. <laughs> I see by your eyes that you agree very well. I will join your group until we reach the evacuation point. Man, these Reavers are actually a really interesting faction. I mean, for a technology cult, they make the Brotherhood of Steel seem tame by comparison. I wonder if they ever went extinct in the Midwest. I'd love to see them as a faction in an upcoming Fallout game. We can access his character sheet too. He is also only 19. Albert Lamour, first ambassador to the Reaver movement. An honest religious zealot who cares for his people and his religion. He is only carrying three stim packs on his inventory, which we can snag. And then, since we've cleared all the way up until this point, we can safely send him back to the extraction point without an escort. And he makes it safely. I see the Brotherhood's word is strong. I wonder if it is as strong as the Brotherhood's single-minded desire to rule the land. Uh, we have been watching your organization's expansion for some time. It is Satansoft's Hellions that brings us together, nothing more. I just pray that I have not sacrificed my people's freedom. My thanks for the escort. Oh, please bring the Reavers back in an upcoming Fallout game. I want to see exactly how Microsoft handles this Satansoft reference. For rescuing the second elder, we are 9,950 experience. Time to rescue the third. Heading south out the door, we arrive at yet another cross street. Next up, mark number three on the map, is the laboratory. Moving south, we find the remains of a battle that must have happened just before we got here. We find a number of destroyed robots and the bloody corpses of Reavers lying in the street. On these two bodies, we find one stim pack, but the other is empty. On one of the robots, we find 9mm armor piercing ammo and microfusion cells on the other. Moving around to the eastern side of the building. All those nasty buggers. And there's a sniper hiding behind some sandbag barricades far to the south. He was tagging my team, so time for Dylan to work his magic. Even though I've swapped the sniper rifle for the laser rifle, he still has exceptional range, and his hits are far more powerful. With the robot dead, we can move north to loot another Reaver corpse. He has 50 caliber ammunition and two stim packs, but the body lying in this opening in the fence is empty. We can step forward cautiously. Yeah! Oh, here comes another. Oh, they almost killed Dylan. Oh, I need to get him a suit of power armor and fast. We can heal him up and then set my squad up in a less chaotic formation. Hopefully this way there will be less crossfire. Moving in, we find a reaver corpse hiding behind a sandbag barricade. 9mm ammunition on his body. On the next one, we find a stim pack. Moving west, we come up against the edge of the building that must be housing the third elder. We do find a door here, but for some reason we can't access it. Dylan's perception picks up another robot on the southern side of this fence, hiding behind some sandbags. Near to the body of the robot sniper we destroyed, we find a crate. Inside the crate, three vials of acid for the squirt gun and more 50 caliber ammunition. Well, I tried picking this door with Babs, but of course it did nothing. All of the locked doors in Newton appear to be jammed or something. 
So we have to find another way into this building. I really didn't want to go through that maze to the south, which we know is being guarded by at least one robot. So moving back north and around to the western side, I was trying to find another door into this building. But the northern side is a solid wall, the western side is a solid wall, and there's rubble blocking the sidewalk, forcing us up against the edge of the map. So we can't get there this way. This means the only way we can get into this building is to go back around to the eastern side and through that small gap in the fence that was guarded by that robot sniper directly into a sandbag barricade maze that we know has a bunch of robots. Crouching down Alice, we can move her into position. She is spotted by one of the robots, but her plasma rifle is doing so much damage that it causes him to hunker down. We've now got him pinned down, and we can move in Harold. We destroy him, but then Harold picks up another robot lying prone to the south. had a minigun, but the two plasma rifles did him in. We can bring in the squad members one by one and set them up against these sandbag barricades. Then, when the squad is assembled, we can move in Cookie. She walks around and loots the robot wreckages. I was thinking this is a prime opportunity for those spider things to pop from the ground, but none did. So, continuing west, we can try to find a door on the southern side, and sure enough, we find one. But we also find a break in the wall, where a destroyed massage tank tried to rub his way in. However, the wreckage of the tank and the rubble that he caused is blocking the hole in the wall. So, this door is really our only way in. We find a number of robot wreckages lying here. On the security bot, we find armor-piercing 9mm rounds. The tank bot is empty. We find two hover bots, each of which has two explosive rockets. Then, taking Harold, we can inspect the door for traps, and when we don't find any, we can open it. Moving the squad inside, we find ourselves right next to a staircase, leading upstairs, and a door leading north into this facility. Bringing in Dylan, we find the place mostly clear. There's a Reaver corpse on the other side of this wall that the massage tank destroyed. On his body is 5.56 millimeter ammunition and two stim packs. But it looks like the Reavers defended this building well. We find a number of Reavers here alive and well, though they're not very talkative. A shopkeep behind this counter. Another guy in this room hiding behind some sandbags. The final room is empty, and we can't even open this door from the other side. There is a platform to the south overlooking a pit, and taking a ladder down into it, we see that we've discovered their research facility. Dylan was close to encumbered by this point, so I brought in Oxhorn to explore this level of the facility. We'll go in a clockwise manner. The central chamber down here is encircled by a number of rooms, but the leftmost room is empty. The three center rooms are each individually empty. The northeastern room is empty. We can go out into a hallway, which is empty. But then the room just south of this room is occupied by a one Tobias Pest and his guards. I am Tobias Pest, a chief of military science projects. On my 11th day of fasting, Saint Sony visited me in my deepest of dreams. He told me of an electromagnetic pulse that will be the salvation of the wasteland. For weeks, I toiled in our temple laboratory until I gave that vision physical form. And by Ohm's holy law, I will not rest until it reaches a place of sanctuary. Here is the key to the safe. The weapon is inside. Our prophecies told us our faith would be tested. But now the robots are taking prisoners instead of letting our fighters go to their rewards in the eternal assembly lines of Panasonica. For what purpose are they taking my brethren? This must be discovered. Let's stop wasting time. Saint Sony? The assembly lines of Panasonica? What's next? Are we gonna meet the Archbishop Toshiba? Perhaps they'll have us pray to Saint Samsung for a visit from Archangel Kodak. I can see now why much of this game isn't canon. It leaves us with a whirlpool of problems. Tobias here has a big book of science, two stim packs and microfusion cells on his inventory. Tobias Peste, Chief of Science, Military Projects Division. 
This loud-spoken man is an acclaimed scientific genius in the area of high-energy physics. Tobias is a man who truly worships science. Most of his inventions are inspired by holy visions that take shape in Reaver workshops. He's also 19. Okay, I'm starting to think that they may have just taken a template and forgot to change the H. We find a safe here, and after using the key that Tobias gave us, we can open it. Inside, we find 45 caliber ammunition, two super stim packs, and a pulse rifle prototype. Oh, it's a rifle. Good job securing the EMP device. Finish the job and rescue the Reaver High officials. This is the prototype for a modified electromagnetic pulse weapon. Minimum strength three ammo microfusion cells, and it weighs nine pounds. The EMP device is a rifle. I wonder if we'll be able to use it soon. Now we just gotta get Tobias to the extraction point. Before we do, we can explore the remainder of the lab, but we don't find anything else. So grabbing Tobias and Oxhorn, we can take him to meet Dylan, then take the three upstairs and out the lab. Before taking Tobias to the extraction point, we can use Babs to sneak upstairs and see what's up here. We find a number of rooms filled with machinery, terminals, surveillance stuff, computers, manufacturing equipment. The most western room at one time was the office for a United States governmental official, and in a shelf against the wall we find three missiles, a super stim pack, and 50 caliber ammunition. We find a few reavers up here keeping watch out the windows and on the exterior platforms. On one platform we find the body of a reaver carrying 5.56 millimeter ammunition and a stim pack. That's it for the upstairs. On my way down, my mouse cursor kept displaying the word workbench as I moved up and down these stairs. But I didn't see one on this level, and on the level below, there's just the stairs. It can't be on this level because we can't access the small room behind the stairs, and north of the stairs is a big open pit. But heading down there with Alice, sure enough, we find a workbench that I missed earlier, and inside it, a toolkit. Strange that we were able to see it with our mouse from three stories above. At any rate, we've secured the third elder now to send him to the extraction point. And with the way behind us clear, we can send him without a bodyguard. Sending him through the junk maze and north up the street, past the manufacturing building, and past the sky bridge, he arrives to join his brethren. However, here I found a glitch. His audio dialogue didn't play. But thankfully, I found the recording in the game files, and so I'll play it here. I will wish you well, only because you now battle the minions of the Dark One. I would not dare to judge the bias of he who is the electric father of creation. It is his will that I instruct your elders about the angelic electromagnetic pulse. And by rescuing Tobias, we again earn 9,950 experience. Three down, one to go. And thankfully, we've cleared the way all the way to the Nuka-Cola factory. It's due east of us, passing the giant Nuka-Cola tanks and the pre-war Nuka-Cola sign outside. We can explore under the tanks to realize that this is actually a lot smaller than we initially thought. There's really not a big factory over here, just a bunch of tanks and tubes that we can't explore. There is, however, this one final building that we didn't explore when we cleared the exterior earlier. Heading inside, we find the last elder, unguarded, alone. His name is Roger Gare. Well met, warrior. This can only be the work of Satan Soft, lord of the tech underworld. His sinister hydroelectric fiends care not for the spiritual enlightenment of science. They seek only to destroy the union between spirits and current flow. If only we were able to make more EMP weapons, we would have halted their electrons in mid-flow. I know of the bargain. Use our divine knowledge to short-circuit these demonic juggernauts while there is still time. Hurry, let us make haste. And there we go, we've got the final elder. Roger Gare, General and Joint Chief of Staff. This large, burly man is the leader of the Reaver Army. He gives the orders for all major military projects. He is a skilled tactician and cunning strategist. He has an ultra stim pack on his inventory. 
as well as a plasma rifle and a mini super sledge, which as we already learned in a previous episode is actually manufactured by the Brotherhood of Steel. So how the Reavers got their hands on one, that's anyone's guess, I suppose. There is a staircase nearby, heading upstairs. We find a room with one chest inside. In the chest, a flamer, flamer fuel, 50 caliber ammunition, and a trauma kit. Heading out to the balcony, we don't find anything out here. There is a ladder leading to a nearby rooftop where we find the Reaver snipers and guards, but no other containers. So heading back down to the ground, we can grab the whole posse and move out to the road. Then, knowing that the path is clear, we can send Roger all by his lonesome back to the extraction point. Make no mistake, warrior. I will not call you friend nor comrade. It is a common enemy that brings us together. Nothing more. Yes, yes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, etc. Thank you, Winston. With the Reaver High Officials safe, you may return to the extraction point. And for rescuing the final elder, we get 9,950 experience. Now we just gotta bring the crew back to the extraction point. And this is made somewhat more difficult by the fact we've got this giant hulking tank to deal with. I managed to get the tank through this junkyard and then we just didn't use it at all because these streets just aren't made for a tank. Don't know why they gave this to us here. Bringing the tank back into this junkyard, we can move in and out and around and crash into this until we finally make it back to the street. Then sending Cookie on ahead of us, we can roll the tank into the extraction point. If we die, this map has a unique death sequence narrated by Ron Perlman. Without the EMP device, the Brotherhood falls to the inhuman machinations. You have failed miserably. Please try again. Now, retrieving the EMP device is an optional objective. It's possible to complete the mission without finding it in the safe. And had we done so, we would have gotten a different ending that sounded like this. What I don't understand is how you failed to retrieve the weapon. While information on the EMP device can be extracted from the Reavers, we are running out of time, brother. Sometimes, I wonder if you do these things on purpose. Dismissed. However, by completing the mission, by saving all four elders and getting the EMP device, this is the ending we get. What's left of the Reaver movement is now being administered medical attention. They are grateful for their rescue, but the elders are not so quick to invite them into the Brotherhood fold. For the time being, they will be kept in one of our many internment camps. This is an excellent time for our interrogators and scribes to pick their brains on any additional technology and their past and future plans. They will be kept there until the elders decide whether to set them free or restrict them to labor camps. The menace from the West's taking of prisoners is most curious, considering that the robots have slaughtered everything before them until now. We must wait and see. Well done acquiring the EMP device. Our scribes are now preparing to modify the weapon to use our power cells. Once this is achieved, we will begin production. I shudder to think what our situation would be without having an actual prototype. The man hours to replicate it would have taxed our scribes tremendously. Once again, good work. Dismissed. Again, with the internment camps and the possibility of putting them in labor camps. Yikes. Is that what happens when you surrender to the Brotherhood? Enemy of my enemy is my enslaver. But with that, we've completed the mission. We rescued all four elders. We retrieved the EMP technology. And we can head back to Bunker Delta to level up, heal up, armor up, and prepare for our next mission. But sadly, I'm all out of time. We'll pick up right here where we leave off in my next episode. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss the next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. 
I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon gain access to a private channel for members only on my Discord server. And YouTube members get a badge that appears next to their name in the comment section of my videos, and they gain access to ox emojis that they can use during the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.